welcome. Thank you very much for making time on a grey Wednesday afternoon. Um, my, uh, my name is Marika Shamiros. I am uh, the acting head of program here at ODI in the Politics and Governance program and also the research director of the Secure Likelihoods Research Consortium, which is kind of the host of this event here today. So we're very grateful that you can make it. We're very grateful to the people online. Um, I will introduce you to the speakers in a second, but actually I want to start the event or the afternoon with a question to you, because usually the question to the audience is always the very last bit, and then sometimes there isn't really enough time. And I thought, no, it would be much more interesting to start with a q and A. I don't know whether we get to the A part just yet at the very beginning of the event, but I want to pose a question to you as people who made a decision to come here today to talk about whether inclusive recovery is possible after conflict. So I wonder whether anybody would volunteer their own motivation or actually the question that brought them here. Why did you come to this event? What is the question that you want to ask? What, what was the moment when you decided this somehow speaks to me and I will make the effort? Any volunteers? Yes, please. Sorry, I think you need to speak up a little bit. Okay, I'll repeat that question. Um, so the question, the, well, the, the motivation was well, there's a lot of displacement at the moment and within the displacement and the conflict um, scenarios at the moment, is there anything like inclusivity possible? We'll get to some of these questions later. My point was a little bit of a different one. My point was that in a lot of what we talk about today and in a lot of these kind of recent debates on how you introduce complexity thinking into some of these difficult questions, there's one point that is always stressed, which is do not start with a solution. Always start with a question. Don't come with some, to something with a preconceived notion. And I thought, actually, it's a very um, tricky thing to implement, even on something as simple as a public event, where we have a very, very specific way of doing things. And it throws everyone to start with a question. So kudos and thanks for pitching in. I had actually kind of expected a stunned silence. Um, but it is, but it is a, it's a comfort zone departure, right, to start with something like this. And, and in a way, that's, that's how I want to start of this event, to say, well, what are the normal paths that we always take in these kind of discussions and the way of thinking about some of these very complex questions that we've outlined for today's talk? So that, that comfort zone, I hope we can sort of leave behind and I invite, invite you all very much um, to kind of try and shed your comfort and, and, and uh, talk about what are the really difficult challenges that we're all facing in answering some of these questions. Um, but we will get to some of these things in much more detail. But um, the other point that I they always take away from these discussions about how to use complex thinking and system thinking in, in some of these difficult questions about things like peace building and conflict resolution processes is the point of memory. How do, how do we memorize? How do we think about? How do we even put pieces of information together? And again, I hope that all of you walk away from this event saying, well, at the very least, it didn't just start off with a boring introduction, but there was a kind of moment where I thought mm, something is a bit different, and then my point would be made. Um, the other point, to make with that is that any kind of change and adjustment and thinking differently about things happens very, very slowly. In the case of this particular program that hosts you here today, it has happened sort of over the past six years. So the Secure Lifelihood Research Consortium has been working since 2011, not with me. So I've only very recently come on board as the director in the kind of final phase of this um, program. But in these six years, a lot of really complex pieces of information, thank you, have emerged and a lot of really challenging questions have been asked, and some of you might be very familiar with some of the research that has been done that really challenges some very profound assumptions that underpin a lot of conflict resolution programs, that underpin a lot of peace building programs, and so on. I won't go into too much detail about that, um, because we have a long list of publications of, I think, about 172 or something, which you could download in your leisure and, and read. Um, but one complex challenge that we've also always encountered in this in running this program was that on the one hand there were very very st strong clear messages that come out of the research that challenge some assumptions but then actually in trying to break down these messages into something that reflects the complexity of the situations that they describe is really really very hard and then to try and 
take the next step to say, how would you then use all this complex information to make, for example, practical programmatic decisions or contribute to political debates? It's a whole, it's a whole other step indeed. So that was one of our dilemmas, which on the one hand, we're required and requested and, and asked to send very strong messages based on research findings. And on the other hand, we often, very often end up saying, yes, we do see this in our data, but it's also, it's complicated, it's more complex than that. And that, of course, is a situation that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. That is the moment when very often conversations, particularly between research and policy making, go kind of stale and often very quiet in the room, because that is a very, very tricky thing to say in a conversation from a research point of view to say, well, something is more complex than that is often heard on the policy side. I don't you know, this is not information that I can engage with. And I've been in many, many of those conversations where you all of a sudden had this kind of eye-rolling moment where everybody was a bit annoyed with each other. Um, and I can see some people knowingly nodding in the audience. So it's clearly something that is happening. And we want to kind of, that's our starting point, that moment of frustration where one side says, everything is really complicated and complex. And the other side says, but yeah, but we still need to make very concrete decisions. And what should we do? Um, the classic example of that being, what do I do differently on Monday morning? So you can see that we come at this big question that we're asking today about inclusivity and peace building and using complex thinking and complex pieces of information from many, many different angles. And I hope that we have assembled a, a wonderful panel of speakers who all speak to these from very different uh, points and perspectives, which I think is really um, is going to be a wonderful event. So the other thing... Um, that I find very striking about some of the debates that we will have today is that we're all very keen on learning. Learning is another one of those themes that at the moment is very, very prominent in all policy debates and all our research programs. We're always asked to provide kind of structured learning approaches. Um, and we, we know that learning is only possible if we very actively facilitate feedback loops. And there's a, a structure to when we do actually engage with what we've learned. But I think we see a specific challenge in, in a conflict, in a post-conflict situation, where the, the very nature of the conflict situation is that these feedback loops, they're not clean. They have a lot of noise. There's a lot of politics in what feedback is given. In very heated conflict situation, feedback is also based on a lot of rumors or misinterpretation. So everything gets a lot messier then it sounds, a feedback loop sounds like a good thing, but everything gets messy. So all of these processes get very, very quickly, very fuzzy around the, ed the edges. And that's exactly where we now launch in the discussion, in the messiness. How can we unpick some of that un messiness between information, decision-making of programs, trying to understand some of these things through research, and figuring out some sort of structured way to even develop something of a bird's eye perspective that allows us to not get lost in the in the nitty gritty of the daily programmatic decision making. So that's what we'll try to do. And the four wonderful speakers that I will introduce to you in a second will help us untangle this, I hope. Um, I just want to very quickly kind of talk you through the run of the event. So obviously, we have about um, an hour and a half. We have each I've asked each speaker to prepare a little bit of an insight into the kind of work and thinking that they do. We then have time for questions from the audience. We have a fantastic online audience. Um, so welcome to everyone online um, who will also be asking questions. Um, and so by the end of it, we all invite you to stay for a cup of coffee and a cup of tea and discuss things further. Um, you can tweet. Um, so uh, the ODI um, tweet is at ODI Dev. And the hashtag that we've decided for today is hashtag conflict recovery. Um, if you're online, please feel free to send through questions at any time of the event. And then we'll get to however many we get to uh, when we can. And we're also periscoping the event on Twitter. So you can also send in your questions by commenting on this video. And so with that, and without much further ado, I'll just give you a very brief introduction to the speakers before I hand over to the speakers. So uh, on my right is Alyosha Donofrio, who is the Senior Director um, Governance in the Technical Unit of the International Rescue Committee. And then on my, other, uh, on my left is Habib Rahman Mayar, the Deputy General Secretary of the G7 Plus Secretariat. And then we have Melanie Garson, a Teaching Fellow in Conflict Resolution at the School of Public Policy at UCL here in London. And then online joining us from uh, DC is Rob Brisiliano, um, whose title at the moment is Systems Thinking and Complexity Coach at the Omid Yar Group. Thank you, Rob, for joining us. What's quite early in the day for you, so thanks very much. Um, 
So I, I'll, I'll hand over to Alyosha first, but I'll just give you a little bit more of his CV so that you know who you're dealing with. So Alyosha, as I said, is the senior director of the International Rescue Committee's governance technical unit. That means he oversees the technical advisors supporting the ISC and partner programs in conflict and fragile affected situ and fragile settings around the world. He has been with the International Rescue Committee since 1997. He's worked in Bosnia as a program manager and as country director in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He held the post of Regional Director for the Africa Great Lakes Program and then Program Development Director for Africa, supporting program development across the continent. Um, he is also a prolific writer. He writes about governance, aid accountability, client voices, urban crisis, and a range of other development issues. And you, if you want to read some of his writing, it's very easy to find it. Um, so, Ayosha, maybe I'll, I'll pose the first question to you. So, I, I mentioned the situation where you have a researcher and a policymaker and maybe a program decision maker in the room and the researcher says, yes, we, it's complex, it's complicated. And then sort of the air goes out of the room. That's at least my experience. But I'm wondering, I'm wondering whether you can talk us through similar situations like that in the International Rescue Committee where the air going out of the room isn't good enough for you because you still need to make decisions. What happens in the situations where kind of the complexity of a situation in a post-conflict scenario seems almost paralyzing and yet somehow you need to move forward to make a decision? How do you choose the information on which you then base your decisions? Okay, thanks. Um, so before I answer that, or in order to answer that, I just actually want to step back a little bit and talk about... Um, about how we handle complexity generally in, in the aid and development industry. Um, because I think that is the underlying problem that we're grappling with in those scenarios where that air has been, you know, has, has gone out of the room or whatever. Um, so, yes, complexity is a huge challenge, um, but not because we don't understand, at least instinctively, what many of the aspects of the complexity of the environment um, are, uh, or the implications that flow there from. So, and when I say that, I mean, don't get me wrong, we can always use more evidence, more research, more data, more analysis, more interpretation. That's very valuable and we're very hungry for it. But the problem is that more of that alone will not actually uh, compensate for what really feels like a kind of structural cognitive dissonance that permeates this industry or this way of working. And sorry, I'm, I'm speaking here really as um, someone coming from uh, uh, doing bottom-up programming in um, uh, conflict-affected and, and fragile settings, many post-conflict recovery um, contexts. So it, within which peace building might be one of, the, one of the ways that we would talk about it, but, but I'm just think, thinking more generally about how we intervene in those, in those settings generally. And so why cognitive dissonance? And I think because, you know, there's tons of really smart people working in this line of work. They sit in donors, they sit in think tanks, they sit in NGOs, they sit in the headquarters of NGOs, they sit in the, the country offices of NGOs, and they work on the front line of program delivery in those NGOs. Um, smart people understanding the complexity of what they're dealing with, and yet all of that smarts is largely disassociated from how programming happens, right? Um, how stuff, how interventions are designed, funded, implemented is not based on that analysis. It's based on a whole bunch of other things. It's projectized. It runs on linear log frames or to linear log frames. It's squeezed into linearity that sits somewhat uh, apart from that uh, more complex reality. Um, there's a rigidity of how these things are funded. There's a rigidity to how they're designed, the time frames in which they're designed, the notion that design is a one-off uh, process uh, that happens at the beginning of something. Um, so all of that is then driving a very standard set of responses, right? There's some very basic tools in the toolbox that you see people coming to time and time again. Uh, tons of training and capacity building or capacity development going on, um, which you know, is an area that SLRC's research has, has looked at in, in, in some quite interesting ways. But like, we, we all know that training doesn't really get you very far, and yet there's tons of training going on. So why is that? What, what is it that's driving that? Um, policy reform. We know that policy reform doesn't yield better services, and yet that is 
an easier thing to do. So people are drawn to that. It's, it's easier to program around that. So why does this disconnect persist? And I think, you know, really, it's really, to me, it's about incentives and it's about um, reward structures. It, you know, if we think about people are rewarded for getting money out of the door, for making sure that it's spent according to the accepted set of guidelines around how you should spend that money. Um, it's about the power of habit and inertia as well. Sometimes doing something differently is very risky. Uh, and, you know, one has to have a good constellation of circumstances to be able to do that. So that, that's the backdrop. And so, in a sense, I think it's important to pay attention not only to the complexity of the environment out there that we're working in, but also to the complexity of the environment in here that we're working in and, and, and be thoughtful as to how we can address that. So what can we do and what, what, what are we doing as, uh, as the IRC, knowing that uh, in a context in which sort of cut and paste and find and replace are the kind of dominant um, uh, design methods for the, for the various reasons that I've mentioned. So what we've tried to do uh, and what our, the experiment, if you like, that we're currently involved in is, is based on a few things. It's about specifying with a quite high degree of precision um, the desired outcomes of any intervention, which sounds obvious and, and basic and, and simple, but so often things are categorized in terms of bundles of activities. Let's take a such and such approach to this, rather than w defining the problem you're trying to solve, defining that problem with the people that it affects, but defining the problem. So sp specificity of, of outcome. We then try to generate um, to the best of our ability, at a pretty generalized level, a set of um, theories of change that inform those outcomes. They're decontextualized to the extent that they're generalized, but they are contextualized to the extent that they are based on our understanding of similar types of patterns that we find in um, post-conflict and fragile settings. Um, the importance of this is really to specify assumptions and to map out um, the breadth of elements that might be at play for something to come about, for some outcome to be achieved. Um, and then against those theories of change, we've then tried to map available evidence and gaps therein, um, precisely to try and get past this problem of not really knowing how to deal with complex and nuanced pieces of evidence that are being generated all the time. And so there's a process of updating and refreshing um, the kind of evidence maps that sit under each of the causal assumptions in each of these theories of chains for each of these generalized outcomes. Um, so it's a huge endeavor. It's a public good. It's, it's you know, clickable and online. And um, if I was a good corporate citizen, I'd probably know the web address, but I, I'll, I can dig that out and make it available. Um, in fact, you can just Google Outcome and Evidence Framework uh, International Rescue Committee and you will find it. Um, but then that's, that's still just an object, a thing, a way of mediating um, research to action. It is not action in and of itself. It is not de design in and of itself. And it's not contextually adapted in and of itself. And that's really then the challenge, is how, and this is when I say we're involved in an experiment. So that piece of the work has been done and is being serviced and updated, the challenge now sits with how do we turn this into better designed interventions given all of the other um, uh, limitations that I mentioned before, the sort of structural uh, limitations that we face in, in, in the work that we do in the industry that we work in. And I think there, um, you know, the, the, to the extent that we've been able to really dig into how people make decisions, what are the kind of um, behavioral nudges that we can bring to bear within decision-making processes at, uh, at the coalface, at, at the design uh, tables that are th around the world that we support. Um, so there we now learning about how uh, we can bring better technical assistance to bear on the problems people are trying to solve in our, in our various different teams. So that's, that's kind of how we're trying to get around this problem. It's not a solution, it's a work in progress, but it's, it's, it's at least a starting point. Okay, great starting point for us, and uh, we will quiz you later on when you think it works and when it hasn't worked. Uh, thanks, Alyosha. Um, I want to turn to Habib, um, and before I formulate my question, I give you a, a brief introduction to Habib Rahman Maya, who uh, I introduced already as the Deputy General Secretary of the G7 Plus Secretariat. 
He was the head of the aid coordination unit in the Ministry of Finance at the, in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan before joining the Secretariat. And he's been working in the area of aid management since 2008, involved in discussions on the Paris Declaration, the Accra Agenda for Action, Busan Partnership, and participated in the negotiations on the New Deal for Engagement in Fragile States, which I think he will talk to us about. Um, he holds a Master's of Management and Policy um, in Management Sciences. And Habib, the second big concept that we are throwing out here today, complexity thinking and system thinking and what to do is one, but the other, concept that we chose was inclusion. And the reason why we chose that was because we thought actually inclusion is one of those things where everybody <laughs> comes with very complex pieces of information to try and make sense of what that could mean. And it means very, very different things to very diff many different people in very different moments of different processes in which they engage. Um, you know, economists look at economic inclusion. Writers of peace agreements look at who can we include in, a, in this peace agreement. People at the negotiating table are thinking about who can they bring to the table. I have a sense that for you, inclusion acts yet on many different other, other different layers of policymaking because you kind of sit in between your own national politics, the politics of the kind of collaborative agenda of the G G7+, plus, and then, of course, donor governments who are engaging. Can you kind of talk us through how you decide when to include whom and, and when to prioritize the inclusion as defined, for example, by a national government over what the G7 plus things inclusion looks like. How do you even decide that? Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. First of all, uh, thank you for that nice introduction. I'm not a researcher, so what I say is from our own practical experiences, and I, I welcome any criticism um, on, on those points. Um, first of all, for those of you who, um, who hear first time for on the G7 plus, <clears throat> Uh, G7 Plus is, uh, is, a, is an intergovernmental group of 20 uh, countries which are conflict affected in, uh, in fragile situations. Um, the membership ranges from Africa to Asia, Middle East, and the Caribbean. Uh, it was established in 2010, uh, <coughs> and uh, three of main areas that we work on is, one, we promote peace uh, through country dialogue, uh, country-led dialogue and reconciliation. And secondly, we advocate for the right interventions. Um, in other words, you know, uh, not to allow that complexity within the environment in the international community to make the situation more complicated in our countries. And thirdly, we also share uh, experiences among ourselves. Of course, I mean, we are labeled as fragile countries or fragile people or, you know, failed states, but we have a lot to learn from each other. And I will, I'll, I'll speak about it um, a, a little bit. Uh, during my intervention. Um, but, I mean, just to answer this question, um, let me also maybe just shed um, light on this issue from, you know, from our perspective. Um, and I have a few points to, to raise. Uh, but before that, uh, as everyone knows that the causes and forms of conflict are as diverse as the, as the countries uh, themselves. I mean, this is the case within the G7 plus countries. We have in different, you know, we have different countries in different stages and where conflict and fragility and the form of them are completely uh, different from each other. Uh, but however, those countries which have been able to break that vicious circle of conflict uh, or which have been struggling with, with, with some of them now have some common trends and you know, features that I would like to mention. And um, I would like to talk about four of them uh, which are relevant to this uh, discussion or this conversation this afternoon that we have. First of all, wars and conflict and violence uh, tears apart the societies. It creates hatred, which takes sometimes decades to neutralize. And it, it, part, it apart the societies, um, you know, in the countries. And, and reconciliation uh, becomes the only, reconciliation with the past becomes the only viable option for us to reconcile with the past in the lieu of, you know, keeping those grievances. Within the G7 plus countries, those members which have uh, kept or which have adopted that path have been able to recover from the conflict and, you know, the vicious circle of conflict fairly quickly than those who have, you know, uh, tried or who are trying to uh, address grievances with grievances. So for us as a G7 plus group, the first priority for us is to stop the conflict and to save human lives 
And then we can, you know, it's, it's to, to, to consolidate peace and sustain peace, that's a long-term process that we have to do. So that's our first priority. And we have some examples here, and we have some uh, resources available on our website as well, and also maybe um, I can share some of the references. We just conducted a study on, on, on the experiences of Timor-Leste in Indonesia. Timor-Leste is a very small country. Most of you have, might have heard about it, uh, where the Secretariat is. And, and it, it consolidates the experiences of you know, it, its conflict with Indonesia, where more than 20% of the population was killed. But just for the brighter future, the leadership and the people decided to forget and reconcile with the past. And that's how now the two neighbors are you know, in, a, in, a, in a great harmony and peace. Um, and we are trying to, to see this kind of you know, experiences in other member countries as well and try to see where we can support using those experiences. Second point is inclusivity in terms of political settlement or in terms of uh, you know, service provision is at the core of the GSOM Plus agenda. Uh, this is one of, you know, this, is, uh, this has been explicitly recognized in the New Deal for Engagement in Fragile States. New Deal, again, is a, an agreement between the G7 plus civil society and the development partners where we agreed on some peace building and state building goals. Um, and uh, legitimate politics or inclusive politics is one of the major or the, one of the first five peace building and state building goals. However, has it been, you know, as, as it has been summarized by the SRLC, you know, research, the quality of inclusivity is something that, you know, it's not normative. What is an inclusive, inclusiveness is uh, something that we need to look at this. And it's, it's differs from country to country. The quality of inclusivity should be defined at the country level by its context, by its culture, and by its people, not internationally. And this has been one of the, the, the areas which has been neglected. I mean, mostly in those political settlements which are backed by, the, by, by externals. And if they have not looked or considered this factor, those peace processes or those political settlements have, have been greeted by failure or be relapse of the, of the conflict. I specifically just refer to one of the examples from my own country, Afghanistan. In 2001 and after that, uh, until the earlier years, the, the ground was very much, you know, it was it was very well prepared for inclusion or you know, for reconciliation with the past. But unfortunately, there was a sense of revenge which overtook the whole situation. And, and, and you know, we, 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 we were not able to include all parts of the, you know, the, all the parties of the, the, the conflict. And that's why the conflict you know, increased um, uh, later on. The third point is the legacy of conflict includes a wide gap between citizens and the states. And filling this gap becomes a crucial determinant to sustain peace and ensure resilience. However, instead of helping to bridge this gap between the citizens and the governments and the citizens and the states, the international you know, development partners, though from the goodwill, does not really help to fill that gap. You know, there is a kind of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, an normative solution that, that does not uh, you know, match with the, with the context. In addition, the state is either expected to run, whether it can barely crawl or walk, because in a fragile, a very fragile situation, it's front-loaded with a lot of priorities, um, um, where, whereas it needs, you know, like to be nurtured so that it can, it can, you know, uh, undertake those responsibility with the time passage. And secondly, um, if the if the state is not capable to catch up with that, you know, uh, with that race. It's usually sidelined, and the international community assume its responsibility to protect instead of helping or supporting the, the, the state institution to nurture its in, in its organic um, um, you know, um, pace. There are you know, some of the services which the states, for the states, very critical. For example, justice and security. And as we know that legitimacy is an issue of you know, relation. And provision or capacity of the states to provide these services is a great determinant of bridging that gap. And these sources cannot be outsourced. These services cannot be outsourced to an external non-state actors. And of course, non-state actors do have a role in the earlier stages of a state. But if we continue relying on it perpetually, we, we end up in unsustainable interventions in these countries. And the fourth point, which is the last point, is that one of the impacts of the onset of conflict, conflict and fragility is the state fragmentation. This is something which we have been, uh, you know, um, uh, we have been victim of. 
Well, unfortunately, talking about the fragmentation, this is further exacerbated by the fragmented approach of the international community, by the projectized approach of the international community, as was, as was mentioned earlier. And the state building agenda becomes a menu or you know, maybe a recipe of thousands of projects which are fragmented from each other. And, and rather than you know, being a one consolidated national plan which is prepared and you know, which is agreed or you know, prioritized by the national actors. And that's why we end up in this uh, chaotic situation. We recently published, again, just to capture these experiences, a study on the public finance management and how the fragmentation in the budget has been, you know, um, has led to, uh, you know, further fragmenting the states and so how some countries have been able to, uh, to address these issues. So now, against these features, we agreed on the New Deal principles. And um, for those of you who do not have the chance to read it, maybe you can go through it and it's available online. It's New Deal for, fragile, for Engagement for Fragile States. And these were the experiences that, f that formed those principles and we, where we agreed with the international community on, you know, uh, that these principles have to be recognized and respected in, in terms of, you know, when it comes to the intervention. However, the problem here is that the New Deal was, unfortunately, in most cases, it became a kind of a technical pres prescription. You know, donors, uh, in most cases, you know, and, and also in some cases the member countries, they took it as a technical pres uh, prescription. And they have each of these actors uh, perceived it in, in, in its own f uh, terms. And that's why the, what we expected to deliver out of the, the New Deal could not have been expected. And the essence of the New Deal was manifestation of the national ownership. The national ownership of the problem and the national ownership of the solutions. I mean, this is the countries which understand its problems, the country which diagnose, they cannot diagnose the, the, the problem, and can devise a solution. The role of the international actors is just to support those priorities rather than th to, to impose. I would just like to conclude with the with with remarks that the role of the international community is not to own the trajectory, but to support it, not to lead, but to bake it, and not to manipulate, but to nurture its, uh, uh, you know, its organic pace. Be that the question of inclusivity, inclusivity in political settlement, and inclusivity in terms of, you know, uh, service delivery. I'll stop here, and I'll be happy to answer any question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Afib. Uh, I have a question straight away, because you made a very important point that the quality of inclusivity is not normative. And I think that poses such an interesting puzzle, because, of course, it is in the very nature of a post-conflict environment, and you mentioned this, is fragmentation. And who to include and who not to include is both a driving force and a result of that fragmentation. So again, if you were to think of this as, as kind of parallel processes where inclusivity is, is both created and supported, but also excluded by existing power relations, how does that play out in the kind of in the scenarios with which you're familiar? Who do you see excluded? Because just the other systemic processes that are at work are just not able to, to rein these the more destructive processes in. You know, here are two points. One is when, when it comes to the earlier stages of conflict, uh, I mean, for us, the, the biggest priority is first to save lives, to stop the conflict. You know, be that, I mean, we, we would want, to, we, we have had, you know, sharing of these experiences with, with different, with very, various countries. So for us, the first priority is just to stop those, those conflicts. And then secondly, when it comes to the inclusivity, this is something that we, when we now state about a state fragmentation, the state itself is excluded. You know, in some, most cases, you have the UN transition, the UN peacekeepers, you have you know, a lot of donors, and the state is somewhere else. And, and when I say that you know, it's fragmented, it's fragmented in a sense that its capacity is fragmented to hold, it is not able to hold that societies you know, together. But in addition, I mean, of course, one of the reasons we are fragile because of you know, several you know, exclusion of, 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 of the communities or you know, societies there. But what we believe and what we have seen is, and also what we are trying to do is just to bring those experiences how to ensure that uh, inclusivity. One of the problems is that not everyone can be happy. Not everyone can be satisfied. You have to find the middle ground, middle way, where we can, you know, for the national interest, for the bigger national vision, you know, for the national interest, we try to promote that notion that we have to maybe we need to forego some of our own interest in terms of, you know, like to, to, to first consolidate the, the, the situation. And, and secondly, um, I mean, this is, this is a dilemma, maybe this is a, a question to the, to, to the research, where we, do we have any common trend? What is inclusivity? I mean, wh wh what, what is the, what, what is the, what determines the, the good inclusivity? Is it just tick marking, you know, that okay, a certain number of societies or 
civil societies or NGOs or, you know, whoever is included? Or is it about more about, you know, the, the, the objective? I mean, for us, I, I, we see that the whole state building agenda, inclusivity may not be seen as an end in itself. It might be a means to more stability and resilience. And, and that's how we perceive it. But of course, it's, it's, uh, um, the, the, there is a need of you know, greater debate to, to identify maybe some common trends of what, what is the quality of those, uh, that inclusivity. But when, when we see about the, the, the fragmentation, I mean, what, what, one, one of the points that in, in inclusivity in, the, in service delivery, we understand that if state is consolidated, if state is cap capable, and if state is nurtured, state is in a better position, in a best position to ensure inclusivity in service de delivery and provision, rather than the international community. Because international community does not know the dynamics of the society, you know, what, what is the relationship in the society. Okay, thank you very much. You gave me one perfect segue after the other to hand over to Melanie Garson um, on your left. So before I do that, I'll, I'll just give you a brief introduction to Melanie as well. So Melanie is a teaching fellow in conflict resolution and international security at the School of Political Science here in London at the University College of London. Uh, she's also a lawyer, and she has a PhD from UCL, as well as a master's in law and diplomacy from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And Melanie's research focuses on the role of reconciliation in stabilizing peace agreements, and that means that she does painstakingly pick apart what exactly is written in a peace agreement and what the long-term effect of what is then written down um, really is. And that's something that's fantastic for us to discuss. And so, Melanie, I want to kind of almost pose... Habib's remark as a question to you, because he did mention that the only viable option is reconciliation with the past. But for me, that still doesn't address the puzzle that in any kind of narrative of what a reconciliation with the past could look like at the moment when the peace agreement is written, it, is a, it has to be, by definition, quite a streamlined, linear narrative of what was going on in the conflict in order to get things down and written on paper. And I know that you've picked apart really a lot of these reconciliation clauses in numerous peace agreements to look at exactly what the long-term effect is. But is, is this one way in? Is, is it necessary to almost have a narrowing of the complexity for the moment of saying, this is how we're going to deal it, with it, and then in the implementation of a peace agreement, broaden it out again and kind of hope that it works? Or are there other ways? Um, thank you so much, and thank you for your introduction. And yes, Habib, you raised and numerous uh, points and there are the challenges in finding both, both this inclusivity on various levels within a peace agreement and you've quite rightly pointed out that the primary function in most peace agreements is the ini initial secession of violence and to be able to bring the parties to the table and to be able to look forwards to stabilizing countries. So in a vast number of the peace agreements, there's certainly I looked at actually reconciliation, however important or significant, I feel it is, and I come to it also from a practitioner to academic standpoint rather than being an academic person. I'm used to that sort of research practitioner uh, tension. But the problem is with a large number of those agreements that were initially brought with a very sort of the ceasefire or even just the initial political solutions is that we were seeing a system of recurrent breakdown where we were entering into almost an era of disillusionment on the functionality of peace agreement, which led to a larger body of research really trying to pinpoint down which of the elements of peace agreements actually help strengthen peace agreements, actually stabilize them. And so you had research, and this is where the conflict between research and practice often comes, with people looking at military position provisions, DDR, civil society, really trying to hone down a body of research of huge quantitative studies of which of these tiny elements act together. My <coughs> approach would arguably that actually you need a peace agreement to be functional. It needs to consider the military, the political, the social, the psychosocial, and the psychosocietal. It has to, to be effective. It's going to have to address all those levels. So we're talking beyond a scrap of paper that's signed on a White House lawn to really thinking about a roadmap for society to go forward. And within that becomes sort of the inclusion of and where does this occlusion come from? And quite rightly, it needs to be done within the societal context of any particular place because it's, but the challenge often comes is what we call the inclusion paradox. 
is that inclusion doesn't necessarily bring stability, or it can bring a certain level of stability or, and a very cold peace. So if we take somewhere like Bosnia, where we're looking at a political inclusion agreement, which ticked all the boxes of providing, if you want, lip service to each ethnic group, being able to have sufficient political power to feel empowered, but ended up with frozen governance on pretty much every level of society that's not allowing the society to develop. So you get this tension between what needs to be done is really sort of a diagnostic exercise at the outset of where does inclusion need to be addressed and what type of inclusion needs to be addressed and that inclusion being done correctly. So if we're considering DDR, are we considering gender DDR, so disarmament, demobilization, as well as just thinking about removing the weapons? Uh, you brought up the argument of displacement. And again, thinking about what are the uh, different needs of different <coughs> elements of society when it comes to reintegration following displacement. And the problem with a lot of the initial political settlements that are largely done at the elite level between various sort of representatives of conflict parties is where is the interest of whichever rebel leader it may be in ensuring child education. It's not on their initial framework of thinking and how do we put that in and also at what stage in the process is it actually appropriate to put that in. So which brings back to reconciliation which in the narratives that in the work that I looked at and I sort of examined sort of 41 of what we call the most intractable conflicts and, so, and all the peace agreements in them. And within them, actually, only, well, there were only 72 agreements out of 259 that had reconciliation clauses. And only about 38 of those were what I would call strong clauses, ones that really set out provisions for victims or how to bring parties together, whether it's in professional elements, whether it's through truth and reconciliation commissions, whether grassroots uh, facilitation. And overall, what came out of that study is that, and this is very much what you were saying about being empowered within the society itself, that the government-led reconciliation is far more effective than external NGO sort of reconciliation itself. The combination of the two is very strong. It helps stabilize peace agreements uh, massively. But, and, but what we do find is the government-led reconciliation has a st far stronger effect. And, but then we find I, this unusual finding that you don't find evidence of government-led reconciliation in contexts where there's no NGO reconciliation. So actually, you need the two. There is a chicken and egg situation here and actually to facilitate the two. So when we begin to look at inclusion and what, where these processes are coming from, it is multi-level. And we're looking at bottom up processes <coughs> and top processes from the all together. And that to some extent, what we need to put in place is perhaps within the framework of a peace agreement, it's very difficult at the outset to get warring parties to start addressing their issues of stereotypes and empathy. And particularly, and is that necessarily the appropriate place when you're trying to get the violence stopped immediately? But to begin to think about within these agreements of setting what I would call the dominoes in place, the ones that can be knocked over to lead to the next one, and where do you put elements in. So one of the big pieces of research at the moment is sort of the gendering of political settlements. And whilst we can't find strong evidence that always inclusion necessarily trickles down to greater inclusion in society, what we do know in those political settlements that don't include any gender provisions, there's virtually no political empowerment for women in the subsequent frameworks. So we know the effect, that the effect of not doing it is very powerful. How we then get about to doing it within the peace agreements is a different question. But I'm happy to take more questions on that, and I hope that <laughs> addressed your point. Um, 
Well, it's a starting point of a very <laughs> complex question. You made a really important point about the diagnostic exercise that, it ne that is needed at the very beginning. And I just kind of read back my notes on this, what type of inclusion, where, and then I added how is it done and, and by whom. And again, this kind of takes me directly back to the central dilemma of this, because that's exactly when we again get to the research moment of saying, well, it's really complicated, because there are all these different types of inclusion that you would need to consider in which parts of a particular conflict area, how will they be implemented, who will be part of it, and who's leading it. I mean, it's, it's reassuring to hear that government-led government is helpful, but then, of course, there are many scenarios in which government is far away from the from the scenario of conflict. So this, again, takes me back to this the, the question of what to do with these kind of many, many different layers of complex information. And this is exactly the moment when we then turn to Rob Rissigliano with all these questions. Um, and I give a short introduction to Rob as well. So Rob Rissigliano is the systems and complexity coach at the Omidyar Group. Um, that means he supports and he guides teams within the organizations and initiatives in efforts to better understand and effectively engage with dynamic systems, of which we've heard many examples here already. Um, and that work is built on his pioneering work in using systems and complexity tools in peace building and social change. Some of that you can read in his mm, 2012 book, was it, Rob? Making Peace Last? I think it was 2012. Um, so, Rob, I'll hand over to you. and. In a way now, of course, we're hoping that you will give us all the answers of how to deal with these many different pieces of information. Um, but I want to start with one particular question, because we've heard in, in different iterations from Alyosha, from Habib and from Melanie, the importance of sequencing and the importance of understanding when to use what kind of information and when to understand that one effect that one could aim for right now could actually just come much, much later down the line. I mean, Melanie used the image of dominoes, but dominoes is still a quite a linear thing. You tip here, you move here, and then it falls down in a line. But the sequencing question is a much bigger one because you, you, we need to think much more complexly about these things. So, so, so now we'd like to hear from you how we then use all these various pieces of information to understand in which directions the dominoes might even fall if we can think in that way. Oh, I think maybe you, maybe your microphone is still muted. Yes, I'm perfect. unmuted now. Thank you. Um, so so uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, sorry I can't be with you in, in person. Um, I was in Hawaii and I decided to fly back to the east coast of the U.S. rather than to London. Um, the, I also think there's a, there's a certain unfairness with um, inheriting all the questions from the previous speakers and being expected <laughs> to answer them. Um, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. Um, I think, yeah, um, I think the, the, the sort of um, central analogy for me is um, one that we use a lot internally uh, to, just, to talk about complexity, which is to distinguish problems that are uh, clock-like versus those that are cloud-like, right? So I, um, I mean, the clock-like ones are manageable. We can fix them. They're predictable. The cloud ones are multi-causal. They're dynamic. Um, we don't necessarily know what the dominoes are even, let alone like what sequence to, to, to put them in, or they might've worked that way in one place, but not another place. And um, when, when it comes to peace processes, I was um, in a session uh, a few weeks ago with a, a group from Colombia who was working on the peace process. And we were, we were there to do some systems mapping of, of the, the peace process. And uh, we checked in with the folks at the beginning to say, what's on your mind as you arrive to the session? And this one person said that he feels like in Colombia, or all of all of them in Colombia, were in a fog. Uh, and and I, in terms of what to do and how to do it and how to you know deal with with making peace, and and I asked, well, so what do you normally do? What do people do when they're in a, d a dense fog? And then another person spoke up and said he had just been um, walking across the Golden Gate Bridge. We we're doing this out in San Francisco, and he said a dense fog rolled in, and he immediately looked down at his feet because that's sort of our our our, our tendency when we, we are confronted by this really hard to understand complexity is to sort of find clarity by by looking to what we know like so it might be the in his case the ground immediately in front of his feet um in a in a process whether you're a different actor you tend to go to the thing that you know best um and do that part of it that that you know best so one way i think people respond to that this sort of um uh immensity of information and the diversity of that information is to focus on the thing they can most easily understand. 
um, and that they can see more clearly. And what's been challenging for the processes we've gone through with our teams, um, and we've, we've done this now with about 20 of our teams internally um, ac- across the various en- organizations that are part of the Amidyar group, um, is how do you get clarity by leaning into the complexity, by actually looking into the fog um, and finding a way to get clarity and, and within that so that you can figure out what to do? Um, and I think that's the first big challenge is kind of overcoming that natural reaction to focus in and, and, ho- and sort of um, limit your vision to opening up your vision and, and actually looking into what at first seems really mind numbing. Um, and, and I think a lot that with a lot of the, um, the peace process work, uh, we, uh, we, we tend to think about peace agreements as being almost clock-like in their implementation. So we have it written down, we can execute it as written and we'll get peace. So executing an agreement as written can be more of a clock problem. Building peace is certainly a cloud problem. And oftentimes implementing agreements as written doesn't actually build peace. Um, and, and I think that's the, that's the, um, the conundrum that people are in. And, and so that when you're in that cloud world, like I said, there's various tools that we use and approaches to, to help and practices to grapple with that cloud and still get clarity and find um, a path forward. Uh, with with um, peace processes, they're, they're not uh, issues to be managed. They're outcomes that emerge. So it's more like surfing. I was just in Hawaii. It was more like surfing than it is, you know, driving a car on a race course. Um, where you, you know, you know how to, where you're going to go. There's a limited set of options. You can go faster or slower. Uh, surfing, you have to actually, it's a combination of, of multiple factors. And you're trying to do, you, you don't know exactly what ride you're going to get, um, how you're going to do or how far you're going to go. And I think that's the, the hard part about dealing with um, peace processes as complex problems is grappling with that emergent nature of them. Um, and it, and I, you know, I love the things that have been said um, about uh, these are problems for the, the local actors to own. Uh, both the problems and the solutions. And, and one of the things that we keep as a mantra internally is that systems change best when systems change themselves, that it's not for externals to change them, that, that the most you can do is sort of understand what are the opportunities in that system. So kind of going back to the, where we started with sort of the theories of change and, and so on, it's not to come in with your favorite theory of change. It's actually to understand the context as it is and then figure out what you do, your theories are changing, your expertise slots into that and preferably slots in alongside those that are sort of on the front lines um, and, and helping them. Um, so we, we talk a lot about um, thinking. So inclusion is also another interesting, I think, um, issue here. So inclusion can be thought of as a clock problem. So, so literally how you include people is we need to invite them and we need to arrange for them to come and there may be some security issues and so on. Um, but inclusion as a cloud problem is actually much more difficult. Um, so, you, so for example, you, you take a lot of conflicts, usually have strong marginalization dynamics in them. So one of the drivers of the conflict was that groups, multiple groups perhaps, are, are marginalized uh, and have been maybe for decades. When people get included formally, what can happen is those same marginalization dynamics just reoccur in the peace process. So people feel alienated they were included, but then they being included just made them understand that they truly are marginalized, um, even in a process that was meant to include them. And so I think that's where not grappling with the underlying forces at play that, sh- that are in that fog. Um, and then we can take steps to understand. Not understanding those from a, the cloud perspective ends up frustrating the clock type processes we, we think we can run. Um, and I should say also that um, when we talk about clock and cloud approaches, they're not either or, they're both and. So we need to see the fog, get the clarity in the fog, see these underlying dynamics. Addressing those dynamics often means we need processes that people can grapple with, that have a first, a second, a third, first do, then do. Um, but then you always have to step back and read that feedback. So Mariah, you talked about the messy uh, feedback loops at, at, at the beginning. Um, and I think um, one of the things that you, you sort of learn to do around information in a, the cloud environment is what we call aligned intelligence. So we all have different views, but if we can have some alignment 
between our central understanding of the issues, the problems, the dynamics, we can act independently, but in connection to a, a common view of what needs to be done. Um, it makes collaboration easier, cooperation easier, coherence, learning and impact easier if we have that aligned intelligence. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it with that. There's, I, I, there's a ton of other things maybe to, to talk about in terms of specific tools, but I think the big issue is, is there are ways to lean into and understand that cloud, get clarity, and then not try to oversimplify it in order to suit our pre, you know, preset ways of operating, but actually work with it to actually surf peace processes better than trying to, trying to manage them. Uh, thank you very much, Rob. I just have one kind of follow-up question because it sounds to me as if there's a, maybe a use for middle ground, and I wonder whether you would phrase it in that way to say you can use some of the clockwork work to almost buy yourself some space for the cloud work. But then, of course, then it's a really difficult question of where to strike the balance. Is there a danger that then everyone kind of goes, we're just doing clock for now because at some point we'll get to cloud? Yeah, I mean, I think people have spoken to that, the nature of that. So in other words, how we end violence, there, there are many ways to end violence. And as important as it is, and often as a, as a precursor to any kind of deeper processes or more meaningful processes, you, you sort of need that. Um, but depending on how you do it um, is going to set you up more or less well to actually do re re counter some of those underlying dynamics, say like a marginalization dynamic. You can end conflict in ways, you can end violence in ways that just sort of um, preserve the marginalization and and don't act and make it harder to deal with. Um, so so I, I, I think it's all about how you go about ending that violence. There's definitely... Um, we, we talk about with our teams that, that you need a kind of a portfolio approach. This is as a donor. So some things you're going to do because they're urgent and they're required and they're necessary. And we, we almost regardless of what their medium and long-term impacts are, that shouldn't be the majority of our spend because that's not our mission across the organizations. Um, uh, but you want to do that urgent piece in ways that align with or don't frustrate what you need to do in that, that sort of longer-term, you know, cloud-like uh, process. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. Before we kind of open up to question, I was just wondering whether any of the other speakers have any thoughts or potential moments of enlightenment when they heard others uh, speak. I don't know, Alyosha, for example, the the image of the clockwork and the cloud work, is that something that in, an, in a situation which often is quite an acute emergency um, comes into thinking at IRC, even maybe if not used, described in that language? Yeah, definitely. Not... Uh, yeah, different different words, similar um, similar ideas. I do, uh, though. I think you know some of the things that you um, you said, Marika, in terms of at, at what point do you stop your kind of me mechanical reactions and start to actually take a more expansive um, view of things is is you know symptomatic of the kind of um, uh, the sort of never-ending debate that gets renamed every few years in, in, in the aid business, which I think currently is going by the name of the Humanitarian Development Nexus. Um, but, you know, it's been a gap. It's been a... Anyway, it's been lots of things. But, but so it, precisely how do you, how do you align uh, a, a kind of short-termist, um, often very life-saving uh, imperative with a... a broader, longer, more complex engagement with the, with the dynamics that were perhaps causing those problems in the first place. But that, yeah, I mean, tons of, tons of insights, uh, but I, I'll shut up because I can go on forever. Very briefly on this clock versus cloud problem, you know, of the inclusivity. Uh, two, we, have, we have two ex examples that I would like to share from the G7 Plus. One is the Central African Republic, a country which, is, which has been in conflict for a long time. And there was this process of peace and reconciliation, we call it the Bangi process, where, I mean, uh, we personally uh, observed that, uh, that process, which was very inclusive. So that, you know, tick marking who to include in the, in the process. But there came some agreements, some conditions, which needed resources. For example, DDRR was one of the, one of the conditions, which needs huge amount of money. And, and now Central African Republic is the poorest country in the world. And, you know, and then on the other hand, you have a massive engagement of the peacekeepers with millions of dollars, but the state itself, I just want to reiterate that, that point, that how important it is to equip the state
to fulfill those conditions, then later on, you know, solve those problems. And second example from my own country recently, you know, just again to manifest or reinforce that point that the state-led process of reconciliation, we just concluded an agreement with, you know, not just, but it has been like a year with, with one of the factions, the Gulbuddin Hikmatyar. One of the success factors of that was also the international support for that process, just to exclude his name from the list of the UN. I mean, I think this is something that, for the greater interest of the country itself, it worked, and so far, hopefully, it will work as, uh, again. So I would, I would, I would, uh, I would emphasize on the on the point that we need the support to actually, you know, f you know, to to nurture that peace process. And that, that, that means, you know, financial support. And again, it's not as expensive as reacting to those conflicts. I think if we spent just portion of what we spent on the consequences of conflict, on supporting that peace process, we will have greater results. Mm. Would you like to comment? Yeah, uh, thank you. I want to also pick up on a couple of things that sort of Rob woke up, uh, brought up in the sense that... Uh, having all this inclusion into peace agreements, and I think Colombia is a really good example with its sort of 297 pages. It's one, I think it's the longest peace agreement ever written to date. And, and given that previously their peace agreements averaged about 18 pages, so it's like been a big step forward, but a long time in coming, is that we do end up with this challenge that peace agreements that are largely more inclusive on every level and going down to the level that I tend to look at a reconciliation, which I believe is fundamental <coughs> to have in there and to have fully developed to, to bridge this sort of ethos of conflict that the parties are uh, sort of stuck in is, can, is both a huge advantage. They tend to be more sustainable on the long run, but they're incredibly, as we pointed out, difficult to implement. And the, the beginning to the sort of this fog of thinking, where do we even start with this initial implementation is difficult. And then, but to also within that 297 pages or however much, is to ensure that those peace agreements are going to be breathing and adaptable. And they have to be thought of as very much not piece of paper. They are living entities and they need to be able to sort of be able to deal with whatever curved balls are going to come at them. And sort of one of the sort of missing things often in peace agreements that go sort of add on to that is the lack of dispute resolution mechanisms. One of the sort of big failings is sort of, we think of things that need to be included in them, is a lot more is how sort of they're going to deal with tension. And that's often the sort of forgotten aspect that needs to be thought of a lot more. Thank you. Yeah, and in fact, that's something that came out very clearly out of SLSE research, that it's incredibly important to have a grievance mechanism. What we don't yet really know and will tackle in months to come is the exact nature of these kind of grievance mechanisms. And then what, what happens after somebody has, has voiced a grievance? So before I open the, the floor, actually, I just want to um, bring in Marcus, who very kindly has seated himself here in the front row. Marcus Lenzen, a senior conflict advisor at DFID, at the Department for International Development. And Marcus, I know that, that DFID is trying very hard to introduce some of this complexity thinking into its, its work. And I wonder whether you can talk us through a little bit maybe how you make choices. At what point is it necessary for DFID to continue like clockwork because there are certain programmatic constraints and in what areas do you see possibility for the kind of cloud thinking and actually also different use of information and the kind of information that we as a research program can bring to the table to help you do your work? Thank you very much. Um, okay, to give a sense, let me see, uh, to make a couple of connections to, to what, what has already been said and give a sense how, how, how yeah, David is trying to to do this. Um, Marika said earlier that that sort of change in adaptation based on lessons that these kind of experiences and 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 commitments that were made in the New Deal or new research findings, especially through SLRC, for example, um, they they happen slowly. So that to uh, bear in mind what I say here is has been taking place over a number of years. The other thing is to link to something that Rob said at the beginning um, when he said. Uh, sorry, when he closed about the need for a portfolio approach for donors, right, and, and aligning uh, this tricky thing about um, aligning urgent, urgent pieces with sort of longer term outcomes and being clear about what they are. Um, to start with that, this is one of the things that when we 
in DFID last year updated our general guidance on how to engage in, in fragile and conflict countries, which we call the Building Stability Framework, was, was one of the main principles of it. How do we get there? to take a whole portfolio approach. What does that mean and why is it important? And it's important for a lot of the reasons that you were setting out here. Um, and and where, 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 is, where was the organization at? Where were we coming from? Um, and what is it that we're sort of trying to change? But also given the fact that if it doesn't work in isolation, it's part of a wider UK government apparatus that has conflicting priorities sometimes, especially with the short versus long-term decision-making that and we work as part of a wider international community, right? And so um, I guess the sense that I want to give is what, what sort of DFIDs, but I think also the wider aid industry's typical approach to complexity is, is, is a, you specialize. Or you say, well, there's a lot of different problems and we create specialisms. It's what a state does, you create line ministries. And it's what DFID does in the sense that we have all sorts of specialist areas of advisors, conflict advisors, governance, economic, social development, health, education. And they all bring their own frameworks to try to deal with the complexities of their issues, right? And in the past, if it had, you know, various layers of diagnostics for these different areas of work in order to deal with the problem that they're specialized in. And I think over time, of course, the realization was particularly when you started to concentrate aid work, particularly in the case for DFID, more and more in fragile and conflicted countries, right? In 2015, we made the commitment to now spend half of our budget in these kind of environments extreme poverty is you know, increasingly located there, and since that's also still part of a key decision for us. So what does that mean for us? It was in 2013 when DFID for the first time rolled out a diagnostic that every single country office had to do. Because DFID in some ways isn't super centralized. We do leave up a lot of things to country level and, and the decisions that, that offices make there. And at that point in time, it, it was called a country poverty redu um, reduction country poverty reduction diagnostic that was then followed uh, because it was felt some things were missing an inclusive growth diagnostic and the logic of it was to say what is our understanding in that country what blocks poverty reduction as one of the key objectives as a development actor we're here to help with reduce extreme poverty um, and since we think one of the answers that no country can reduce extreme poverty and no country for that matter can escape high levels of fragility without growth. So the converse question was, what is it that blocks growth? And sort of, in a sense, get um, a, a, a sense of the system of the in, you know, blockages, but also then what could kind of unblock this and where could our resources best concentrate in, in the spirit of, of an external aid that has its limitations to unblock this and, and set the path on it. And then you have other diagnostics that are, again, specific for conflict environments and to particularly understand what, what drives um, um, uh, and, and causes conflict and, and how do we understand that and how do we interact with it as, as an actor. And there's one, again, diagnostic that's um, specific for the whole of the UK government called a joint analysis of conflict and stability. But, but all of these have their limitations, right? They, they will tell you at the end of the day things like, um, very often across the board where they were applied, uh, what blocks poverty reduction, what blocks growth in that country, the nature of the political settlement, the intensity of conflict, you know, uh, etc. So you again come up with a, a, set, a complex set of things that then you think, well, how do we break that down further, right? Um, so you, you kind of get into sort of a complexity trap of everything gets ever more complex, even though you try to bring it more together. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're, what, what's been happening in, uh, sort of uh, on the back of these, of trying to digest what these said, we did an update sort of some two years ago. And we're currently in, in the process of organizationally thinking the next time we do those, and we haven't yet quite decided when, because of course we know that if we don't do this on somewhat regular basis, we won't know what's changing with it, what we sort of assumed was going to happen, and some of the assumptions we made in designing also responses with partners in this, whether that's actually working, whether it's unblocked the thing that we thought we were gonna try and unblock, right? And what's happening now increasingly is this effort, and, and you see it also in the way that all these specialist cadres are, and that was part of the point of the framework I mentioned earlier, to get a very different conversation going, even just in the complexity, you were mentioned this earlier, Lasha, the complexity of our own organization. How do we create the space and the dynamics to talk a lot more across these specializations, realizing that for the kind of problems that we're talking about, 
that are much more cloud than uh, clock, and we need to both in-house and then sort of beyond have a very different and um, way of talking about it, of trying to understand it. And that then comes back into the incentives that the organization sets and the space that it gives and the time that staff has that is not caught up in, again, what Aloysia said earlier about just being caught up in project management and sort of delivery rhythms and all that kind of stuff. The other thing that happens sort of conversely is in Diffit saying, also saying, we re if we're working in environments that ultimately are much more complex and much more volatile and more likely to keep on uh, being in a fragility trap and not quite getting out of it, and that will take a long time. So um, our systems actually fit for this, and we had to say no. We took a very hard look at it, and in the end what we did a few years ago is throw our whole rule book out and said it's not, it's too complicated to, to, to just tinker with it and replace it with what we call the smart rules which are much, 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 much shorter, and where the assumption was that this is sort of general guidance, and then you leave more up for, for, for the context in it, right? And then we then now update them sort of on a regular basis and avoid to it become, a, again, a huge rule book. That, for example, says it is not absolutely necessary for us to use log frames in program design. All right. All right? <laughs> Now we come back to the slow speed of change, <laughs> is that if, however, if you look around, you still find, of course, that this is the, the feat that you were referring to. Well, that's what we know best, and very often people get a bit uh, uh, edgy um, when they think, oh, but, but how will I be able to demonstrate and show accountability if it's not input, output based? And mm -hmm. after all, uh, we have to be very accountable to the British, British taxpayer. And if we can't explain exactly what we spend the money on and can't follow it, then they will not be very happy and, and we'll will not be able to support this very much longer. Nonetheless, I think you're starting to see some cases where, where this whole process that's been happening over the last few years is leading to, in some cases, and it depends a lot now on, again, on individuals, you know, on heads of office and, and other advisors that are taking this thinking up bit by bit uh, and saying, I'm gonna try something different and I'm taking this on board and I, because my rules also say I don't have to do it the way that we used to and I actually think it's not gonna work here and we've seen, we've had a number of failures so let's change this. Let me stop there for now just to give you a sense of a bit what's happening in, in our organization in this regard and I'm sure we'll come back to some of these things. Fantastic, thank you very much Marcus. Okay, the floor is open. I, I, uh, if anybody has a question, now is the time to ask it. Otherwise, I'll go to some of the questions from the online audience first. But we have one here, Eva. Yeah. 